So let's start off this episode at number 10, the different genealogies of Jesus. So it was said that the Messiah had to be of the line of King David, and it's found in various Old Testament books of the Bible, like Jeremiah and Isaiah. So the two Gospels in the New Testament, they provide genealogies of Jesus to validate this requirement. Now, in the book of Matthew, chapter 1, verses 16, that passage goes as follows. Jacob was the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, and Mary was the mother of Jesus, who is called the Messiah. Now, the other genealogy in the book of Luke, chapter 3, verses 23, it goes backwards and it begins as follows. Jesus was a son, so it was thought of Joseph, the son of Heli. Now, the most common response to this is to say that the genealogy in Luke was for Mary, but that's not what the text says. It says that it's for Joseph. So, was Joseph's father Jacob or Heli? Number nine is what did these women actually do at the tomb? So, there are some women that discovered the empty tomb of Jesus and they returned to tell others. This is recorded in the book of Matthew 28, verses 8, and it says, The women hurried away from the tomb, afraid yet filled with joy, and ran to tell his disciples. Now, this is also corroborated in the book of Luke 24, verse 9, that goes, When they came back from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and all the others. But Mark's account has a different outcome. It says, trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. And that's found in Mark 16, verses 8. That's actually how the original version of the Gospel of Mark ended that verse. But later on, an addition was made that extends the verse. And it made the verse fall more in line with the accounts of Matthew and Luke. So depending on the Bible, it may read a little bit differently. All right, moving on to number eight. No one can see God. Yeah, that's mentioned in 1 John 4 verses 12. No one has ever seen God. And also, 1 Timothy chapter 6 verses 16 says, No man has seen or can see God. But did some people in the Old Testament, like Abraham and Moses, see God? There's a passage in Genesis 18 verse 1 that says, The Lord appeared to Abraham near the great trees of Mamre while he was sitting at the entrance to his tent in the heat of the day. Also, a verse in Exodus chapter 33 verse 11 says, The Lord would speak to Moses face to face as one speaks to a friend. So is this God literally appearing or did God take on a different form to appear? Yeah, there's many different arguments for this contradiction too. Number seven brings us ancestral punishment. Exodus 20 verses 5 says, I the Lord your God am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. Now, another verse in the Bible found in Deuteronomy chapter 24 verse 16 says, Fathers shall not be put to death for their children, nor children put to death for their fathers. Each is to die for his own sin. <laughs> Looks like a contradiction right there. We move on to number six. Does God support lying? Proverbs 12 verses 22 says, The lying lips are an abomination to the Lord. But the book of 1 Kings 22 verses 23 says, Therefore, look, the Lord has put a lying spirit in the mouth of all these prophets of yours, and the Lord has declared disaster against you. Halfway to number five, how old was he? So let's take a look. In the book of 1 Kings chapter 24 verses 8, we find a passage that reads, Jehoiakim was 18 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned in Jerusalem three months. Now, a parallel passage found in the book of 2 Chronicles 36 verse 9 says, Jehoiakim was eight years old when he began to reign, and he reigned three months and ten days in Jerusalem. So was he eight or eighteen? Moving on to number four, did the sun rise or was it still dark? Mark chapter 6 verses 2 says, And very early in the morning, on the first day of the week, they came unto the sepulchre at the rising of the sun. Now, the book of John 20 verses 1 says, The first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene early, when it was yet dark, unto the sepulchre, and see the stone taken away from the sepulchre. Okay, so we see rising of the sun, but we see in the morning while it was still dark. Rising of the sun offers a different picture than being still dark. So, 
Contradiction or not? The contradiction at number three is how did Judas lose his life? This is a pretty popular one. In the account of Matthew chapter 27 verses 5, it says, And Judas cast down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed, and he went and hanged himself. So we all know what hanging is, but there's another account of this in the book of Acts chapter 1 verses 18 that says, Now Judas purchased a field with the reward of iniquity, and falling headlong, he burst asunder in the midst, and all of his bowels gushed out. There have been some arguments saying that these verses just fall on some different semantics and language uses. It's possible to be hung and also be split open. It just really depends on what part of the hanging you're referring to. But either way, regardless of what argument is used, it still hasn't been enough to clear this up fully as being a contradiction in certain people's minds. The contradiction number two is by twos or by sevens. This brings us to the first book of the Bible, Genesis chapter six, verses 19. It says, and of every living thing of all flesh, two of every sort shall you bring into the ark. Now in the very next chapter, Genesis chapter seven, verse two, it says, of every clean beast thou shalt take to thee by sevens, the male and his female, and of beasts that are not clean by two, the male and his female. So it does further explain that animals that are clean would go into the ark by sevens and the unclean ones would go into the ark by twos. But the argument made about this contradiction really is why in Genesis 6 would it say that every living thing of all flesh, rather than just simply saying that there would be some animals going in by two. Why use the term all? Now we end off with number one, the children of Michal. Therefore, Michal, the daughter of Saul, had no children unto the day of her death. And that's found in the book of 2 Samuel, chapter 6, verses 23. Now in the book of 2 Samuel, chapter 21, verses 8, so a little bit later on in the book, it says, But the king took the two sons of Rizpah and the five sons of Michal, the daughter of Saul. So we see the same Michal. One says that she has no sons. The other one says that she has five sons. Were these five adopted sons, maybe? Still an apparent contradiction in the eyes of many people. Starting this episode off at number 10, we have six or eight days of creation. We find a passage in Surah 7 verses 54 that says, Your guardian Lord is Allah who created the heavens and the earth in six days. Okay, so pretty clear. But then we move on to Surah 41 verses 9 to 12 and it goes as follows. Say, is it that ye deny him who created the earth in two days? And do ye join equals with him? He's the Lord of all the worlds. He set on the earth mountains standing firm high above it and bestowed blessings on the earth and measured therein all things to give them nourishment in due proportion in four days in accordance with the needs of those who seek sustenance. Moreover, he comprehended in his design the sky and it had been as smoke. He said to it and to the earth, come ye together willingly or unwillingly. They said, we do come together in willing obedience. So he completed them as seven firmaments in two days and he assigned to each heaven is duty and command. So when you add up two plus four plus two, that equals eight. The contradiction number nine is, will Christians go to paradise or hell? So, you know, from the beginning, pretty much Christians have been accused by Muslims of being polytheistic. And by the way, polytheist just means worshiping of multiple gods because they say that, well, hey, Jesus is exalted as God, so that's polytheism. And here's one passage that actually says this, anyone who puts anyone with Allah, God will deny access to the garden. His shelter is fire. And that's found in Surah 5 verses 72. So there are some other places though that promise paradise to Christians as well as others. Those who believe and those who are Jews, Christians, and Sabian, those who believe in God and the last day and act right, they will get their reward with their Lord. They should not be afraid and will not be sad. And that's found in Surah 2, verses 62. Okay, so when some people see this, they're left pretty confused, wondering 
Which one is it? Are Christians going to be left out because they associate partners or put partners equal to God in the case of Jesus? Or are they going to be accepted into heaven if they act right? Next up, at number eight, blood, clay, dust, or nothing. What are we talking about, right? What was man created from? That's the question. Well, in the Quran, we see several passages that give different accounts of what man or human beings are made from. I'll be sharing just five of them. Surah 96 verses 2 says, created man out of mere clot of congealed blood. Surah 15 verses 26 says, we created man from sounding clay, from mud molded into shape. And then another surah says, the similitude of Jesus before Allah is as that of Adam. He created him from dust, he said to him, be, and he was. Taken from Surah 3, verses 59. From there we look at Surah 19, verses 67 that says, But does not man call to mind that we created him before out of nothing? Final one, Surah 16, verses 4 says, He has created man from a sperm drop, and behold, this same man becomes an open disputer. So right there we see five. Moving on now to number seven, there being no compulsion in religion. Now perhaps one of the most quoted verses used by critics of Islam is the one about there being no compulsion by force to accept Islam. And it goes as follows. Let there be no compulsion in religion. Truth stands out clear from error. Whoever rejects evil and believes in Allah hath grasped the most trustworthy handhold that never breaks. And Allah heareth and knoweth all things. And that's taken from the second surah, verses 256. But another verse in the Quran seems to give a different idea when it comes to accepting Islam. And this one goes as follows. And an announcement from Allah and his messenger to the people assembled on the day of great pilgrimage, that Allah and his messenger dissolve treaty obligations with the pagans. If then you repent, it were best for you. But if you turn away, know ye that you cannot frustrate Allah and proclaim a grievous penalty to those who reject faith. That's taken from Surah 9 verses 3, another apparent contradiction in the Quran. From there we move to number 6, the first Muslim. This is what Surah 39 verses 12 says, And I, Muhammad, am commanded to be the first of those who bow to Allah in Islam. However, the Quran makes mention of others before Muhammad who submitted to the faith of Islam, like Abraham and Jacob, for example. One verse of the Quran says this, and this was a legacy that Abraham left to his sons, and so did Jacob. O oh, my sons, Allah hath chosen the faith for you. Then die not except in the faith of Islam. That's taken from Surah 2, verses 132. Halfway to number 5, forgive or not forgive. Here's a verse that speaks about Allah not forgiving those who worship other gods. Allah forgiveth not that partners should be set up with him, but he forgiveth anything else to whom he pleaseth. To set up partners with Allah is to devise a sin most heinous indeed. And that's found in Surah 4 verses 48. Now the following passage of the Quran shows those who worship idols being forgiven. The people of the book asked thee to cause a book to descend to them from heaven. Indeed, they asked Moses for an even greater miracle, for they said, Show us Allah in public. But they were dazed for their presumption, with thunder and lightning. Yet they worshipped the calf, even after clear signs had come to them. Even so, we forgave them and gave Moses manifest proofs of authority. And that's found in Surah 4 verses 133. Number four, is this haram? Drinking wine, good or bad? You be the judge, guys. O ye who believe intoxicants and gambling, dedication of stones and divination by arrows are an abomination of Satan's handiwork. Eschew such abomination that ye may prosper. That is taken from Surah 5 verses 90. So this verse clearly prohibits wine drinking, right? Now, there are two other verses that do mention wine actually being a reward. Here is a parable of the garden which the righteous are promised. In it are rivers of water, incorruptible, rivers of milk, of which the taste never changes, rivers of wine, a joy to those who drink, and the rivers of honey, pure and clear. 
In it there are for them all kinds of fruit and grace from their Lord. Can those in such bliss be compared to such as shall dwell forever in the fire and be given to drink boiling water so that it cuts up their bowels to pieces? That's taken from Surah 47 verses 15, by the way. Now another passage goes as follows. Truly the righteous will be in bliss. On thrones of dignity will they command a sight of all things. Thou wilt recognize in their faces the beaming brightness of bliss. Their thirst will be slaked with pure wine sealed. That verse is taken from, and this passage is from Surah 83 verses 22 to 25. So wine, haram or not. Moving on now to number three, did Noah's son drown? So the first verse I'm going to quote is Surah 21 verses 76. And remember when Noah had cried out to us earlier, so we responded to him and delivered him and his family from the great distress. So some people have pointed out that if his family was all saved, then how come in another verse it says that Noah's son drowned? And this verse goes as follows. The son replied, I will go to a mountain for refuge and it will save me from the water. Noah said, none can save anyone today from the command of Allah except those whom he may have mercy. Thereupon a wave swept in between the two and he was drowned. That's found in Surah 11 verses 43. Now for the contradiction at number two, is evil from God? Wherever you may be, death will overtake you, even if you should be within towers of lofty construction. But if good comes to them, they say this is from Allah. And if evil befalls them, they say this is from you. Say, all things are from Allah. So what is the matter with those people that they can hardly understand any statement? That is taken from Surah 4 verses 78. But then in the following verse, we read this. What comes to you of good is from Allah, but what comes to you of evil, O man, is from yourself. And we have sent you, O Muhammad, to the people as a messenger, and sufficient is Allah as witness. So is evil from God or not? Now finally, we end off with number one, a date with Allah. Is it a thousand years? Surah 22 verse 47 says, A day with Allah is as a thousand years of what ye reckon. Now another verse says this, He directeth the ordinance from the heaven onto the earth, then it ascendeth unto him in a day, whereof the measure is a thousand years of what ye reckon. That is in Surah 32 verses 5, but we find a different time span in the 70th Surah. Check it out. Unto him is a day whereof the span is 50,000 years. And that's found in Surah 70 verses 4. So one common explanation in defense of this passage is that it's not actually referring to literal years. Rather, these numbers are simply referring to long periods of time. Like if somebody says, hey, I told you millions of times not to do that. Or if they say, hey, I told you already a bunch of times not to do that. Those two statements can, you see, either be taken literally or metaphorically and don't necessarily contradict each other. It just really depends on perspective.